Hey, 42 here. 2020 has already earned a dreadful reputation. World War III nearly began, devastating fires have swept throughout the world, and now we have an historic pandemic on our hands. And we're not even a third of the way through the year yet. But it's also becoming the year of something else. Introverts. With a significant portion of the world's population under some sort of lockdown, staying at home and being unsociable is the new normal. In fact, in most cases, it's the law. Introverts around the world are silently laughing at the struggling extroverts who are wondering what mental superpowers these less socially active people possess. Partying, shopping and other general social activities are now a distant memory, something we probably now realise we all took for granted. Even popping to the shops to buy essential supplies and going for a walk is now strictly limited. And for the most vulnerable in our society, banned altogether. Social distancing isn't a choice anymore, it's essential. But how will self-isolation change us? And how will it change the world? For the better or for the worse? Well, if history is anything to go by, this year's global quarantine will change the world forever, and perhaps in many positive ways. Isolation isn't new. You could even call it biblical. As an account of separating out infected people to prevent the spread of disease can be found in writings dating back to the 7th century BC, or perhaps even earlier. It states in the book of Leviticus, the priest is to isolate the infected person for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine him, and if he sees that the sore is unchanged and has not spread in the skin, he is to isolate him for another seven days. Fast forwarding to the year 706, and isolation of the sick became mandatory, especially with illnesses such as leprosy. During the Middle Ages, so-called leper colonies started to spring up everywhere, especially in Europe and India. But this was just an attempt at separating the already sick from the healthy, isolating the virus or bacteria from a potential new host. This worked when people were showing symptoms, sure, but what about the asymptomatic cases? The people who were not showing any symptoms yet, but were still unknowingly spreading the disease. With an incubation period of between two to six days, the Black Death, bubonic plague, gave its hosts ample time to go about their days unnoticed from the point of being infected to showing the first signs of the deadly disease, after which there was roughly a 37 day interval from infection to death. The Black Death was the most devastating pandemic ever to be recorded in human history, and resulted in the deaths of up to 200 million people across Eurasia. As you can imagine, maybe a little too easily these days, death was everywhere. Plague pits were dug in villages, towns and cities for the citizens to carry and dump their dead into, probably infecting themselves in the process. It was clear that just isolating the visibly sick wasn't going to do the trick. And during the second wave of the plague, in 1448, the Venetian Senate isolated incoming ships for 40 days as an attempt to stop newly infected people from disembarking. This 40-day isolation seems to be an effective way of handling outbreaks of the plague, and gave birth to a word which we have been using quite a lot recently. Quarantine. Coming from the Venetian word, quarantina, meaning 40 days. Of course, we now know that the bubonic plague was predominantly spread through the bite of infected fleas and rarely through human to human contact. But at the time, it was highly suspected that the disease was spread through the air by what was known as a miasma, to put it simply, bad air. It was said that miasmas were characterized by a foul smell, which to be fair, could have just been the constant stench of people throwing buckets of shit out their windows. But since medical science wasn't really a thing back then, their nose was all they had to go on. And if these plague-ridden people were going to be filling the air with their smelly, rotting, pus-filled buboes, it was clear what had to be done. Social gatherings had to be stopped. Over a hundred or so years later, in 1603, under the Union of the Crowns, James I received a sudden promotion as the King of England and Ireland. 
even though he was from Scotland. But that's another story, which you can read about in my book. However, before he barely had the time to plunk the crown onto his head, another devastating outbreak of bubonic plague was sweeping throughout London. Eager to have a significant amount of subjects to rule over, James I thought it best to stop the spread of the disease. One of his first actions as monarch was to issue a book of orders, a set of rules to be obeyed by the public, with the hope that it would prevent the spread of the plague. Laws were put in place stating that houses were to be closed for up to six weeks if one of the inhabitants became sick, and that if they ventured into the community, they should mark their clothes so as to warn others that they were infected. Similar to how today some men adorn a man bun to warn others that they're easily offended. Another measure established was that theatres were to be closed for fears that the plague would spread through the crowds. It didn't help that the authorities weren't overly fond of the theatre to begin with, too much cross-dressing and campness for their liking. A preacher at the time sternly stated that the cause of plagues is sin, and the cause of sin is plagues. Ultimately, this meant that theatres were one of the first to be closed, and between 1603 and 1613, the Globe and other London playhouses were shut for more than 60% of the time. This means that a certain playwright at the time, who you may have heard of, had a lot of free time on his hands. During this period, William Shakespeare wrote some of his most renowned plays. Forced into self-isolation due to quarantine restrictions, Shakespeare put quill to paper and produced some of his most famous, dark and best pieces. Plays such as Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, Antony and Cleopatra, the list goes on. Shakespeare made many references to disease and to death in these plays, most likely drawing inspiration from the world outside his windows. In King Lear, the king, rather harshly, calls his daughter a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood, making reference to the nasty enlarged lymph nodes, a predominant symptom of the bubonic plague. If it weren't for the lockdown of London, would he have ever written these works of literary gold? Or would have he been too busy with the mundane day-to-day -day runnings of his popular playhouse company? I can probably guess. About of dysentery, a civil war, and a beheading later, Charles II took the throne. It was summer in 1665, and the last major epidemic of the bubonic plague had just hit England. It would come to be known as the Great Plague of London, and stole the lives of a quarter of London's population in just 18 months. And then rather unluckily, the very next year, the Great Fire of London hit, which burnt down most of the city. So let's hope that's not yet to come for us. Charles II had a particular interest in science and recognised the vital importance of proper social distancing. This led to measures that are not too unfamiliar with our own today. Aside from keeping the sick at home along with their entire household, the government supplied food to the housebound, so as to ensure they had no reason to leave their home. In shops, merchants would ask their customers to drop their coins into dishes of vinegar to sterilise them before they purchased anything. The 17th century version of contactless payments, if you like. All public gatherings, including funerals, were halted, and notably, Oxford and Cambridge universities closed their doors. Students were sent home to continue their studies, and a young man named Isaac returned to his family's estate, where he self-isolated himself. I am, of course, referring to one of the most influential scientists of all time, Sir Isaac Newton. And little did he know, this time of isolation would be his most productive years yet. Whilst taking a leisurely stroll in the garden, an apple tree, yes, that apple tree, caught his attention. He mused that the force which brought apples to the ground mustn't be limited to a certain distance. Why not as high as the moon? he is alleged to have said to himself, and just like that, the theory of gravity was soon born. In 1667, he returned to Cambridge, bringing his theories with him. Two years later, he was a professor. It may not be as fun as the anecdote of an apple hitting him on the head, but it's still an incredible story, and brings with it an important message. When we take a step back from normal life, we're able to see things from a new perspective, it's like an extreme version of why it's easier to think of great ideas in the shower. 
Distraction from the normality and routine of life gives our brains a break. So our subconscious can work on a problem more creatively in its own time. All the free time during quarantine probably helps as well. But this begs the question, with most of the world being held under some sort of quarantine and isolation right now, what does our future hold? Is there a teenager currently stuck at home and in a desperate bid to get some peace and quiet from his family is learning how to code for the first time? Those first lines of code could one day transform into the next world-changing technological advance. Is a bored scientist self-isolating and in the meantime experimenting with a home DNA sequencing kit, potentially unlocking the secrets to immortality, or at the very least making us all glow in the dark? Is a teacher finally following his dreams of writing a novel, which one day could be a number one bestseller and become a true classic? The probabilities are truly endless. And in these uncertain times, the prospect that the fallout could be a bright one brings a lot of hope. But there is one thing that is certain, one undeniable benefit that this mass earth quarantine will produce, technological advances. You've probably noticed it yourself, everything is now being done online, even more so than ever before. Just a few months ago, the thought of working from home every day, attending virtual events, and still being able to have close, meaningful relationships through a screen seemed a little too futuristic for 2020. But we're here now, and we're doing it. I'm not saying all of this is necessarily good for mental health, because it isn't. But you can bet there will be enormous technological progress to emerge in the years to come because of it. And we've all done this after just a couple of months of being forced to find a way through this chaos and with the somewhat limited technology we had to hand. We are about to experience a technological revolution. The future is here. So why not start that new hobby, write that novel or learn that new skill? You might not get another chance quite like this for the rest of your life. Let's hope you don't. But you could just change the world. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. It really helps me to continue to make these videos. The link's in the description. Also, if you want to get your hands on a first edition signed copy of my new book, Sticker Flag in It, A Thousand Years of Bizarre History from Britain and Beyond, then head on over to Unbound Publishing. The link's in the description and get yours today. Thank you.